one of the great personalities, one of the great personalities of India's HVAC industry, Mr. Puike Goyal, sir. I am proud to welcome him on behalf of the Kolkata chapter. Good evening, sir, and welcome to the forum. I am very happy that some of our senior members and mentors of our chapter are also part of today's event. I take pride in welcoming our presidential members, Mr. Deepak Burma, sir, and Mr. Gautam Mukherjee, sir, to today's event. But without wasting much time, I would request the Naranjana to carry forward today's very important evening. Thank you, friend. Welcome once again. Thank you, Manish, sir. Uh, moving on with the evening, I request my vacant team for the show of the disclaimer slide. Thank you. Thank you very much. I now invite Mr. Gautam Mukherjee, past president of Ishtray Kolkata chapter, also have been RD and managing director of Universal Group to formally introduce our speaker for the evening. Welcome, sir. Thank you, Nilanjana. Good evening to everybody. I feel really privileged this evening to introduce a person whom I respect from the core of my heart. Last decades I am hearing from him, whenever he meets me, he shakes hands with me with laughing and in a very affectionate manner. And I tell you that uh, well, Niranjana requested me that I have to introduce this gentleman, I snatched this opportunity of my own. I said, I love to do it. It's a pleasure for me. And he is none other than Mr. Prabhat Goel. We always tell him PK Goel, sir. And he is really respected for us. And I, I like to share with all of you that these sort of people has brought this Ishre in this stretcher. Always Calcutta uh, chapter has taken his help. He has delivered number of uh, number of papers for us in our programs. Whenever we called, whatever we want, he has always said yes. He never said, I have not heard anything from him to say no. So I, even the students who are here, please hear him. See for the society what contribution a person can give. And I will love to share with all of you here today that he is, he was graduated in Bachelor of Technology, Honors Mechanical Engineering from our great uh, institution, Indian Institute of Technology, Khadakpur. Graduated in the year 1977 obtained lead certification from the U.S. Green Building Council in the new construction stream in year 2008, examination of Green Building Council. Career Comfort Network, part one and part two certification from Bynan Institute, Cyprus in 1988. 40 years of experience. Can you imagine 40 years of experience in the HVAC industry, including design, Project execution and commissioning. He joined Voltas in 1977 and thereafter worked with UTS career year in Dubai. He was part of JCI team in India till September 2013. Now work as a HBAC consultant on large HBAC projects, visiting faculty of Ishre Institute of Excellence in Delhi. Relevant experience, you will be highly impressed to know that first DDC-based system in Dubai in 1989, he executed. First carrier comfort network system in Abu Dhabi in 1992. First off-site chiller remote monitoring station in Kuwait in 1990, fully automated and sequenced chiller water plant in SJMC Abu Dhabi, Dubai in 1995. Automated and sequenced 
The district cooling system plant in UAE 1998, one of the largest steel water plants in Turkey. Can you imagine? It is 30,000 tons at Korakets Bursa in 2002. So from 20 years back, he had executed a plant of 30,000 in Turkey. So I am very proud to uh, take him to our program today. And I love to share with him this evening and learn so many things. Sir, this stage is for you. Well, sir, I welcome you for our program. And we are here to hear you. Thank you all. Thank you so much, sir, for that generous introduction. Uh, we welcome Goel, sir, uh, for this uh, evening as a speaker now. Uh, to all the audience, I again request you kindly keep yourself on the mute mode. With If you're operating from your phone, please keep that in silence as well and kindly switch off your video. If during the session you have any questions, kindly put it in the chat box. We have a separate uh, time slot allotted for question and answer. And each and every question will be answered by our speaker. We will take up every question individually. Please kindly do not disturb the speaker by uh, unmuting yourself and creating disturbance via noise. It is a request uh, as an online program. We have to maintain this discipline, please. Thank you, everyone. And uh, sir, again, welcome. And the stage is all yours. I believe sir is experiencing some uh, some internet issues. Yeah, I think Nalanjana uh, looks like he is disconnected. Yeah, I sir got disconnected. I'll just be calling him. Yeah, sir, uh, kindly give him a call. Maybe he didn't realize that. Yeah. Request the audience uh, for kind patience. Uh, these things are beyond our control and we really have to adjust. Uh, please be patient for one, two minutes. I'm sure Sir will join back. Uh, yes, I just had a talk with Dwell, sir. Uh, there was a power outage uh, at his location, so uh, he had to got disconnected. Uh, he is just joining back a couple of minutes. So I would request our members to just bear with us till that time, and uh, we will soon have uh, Dwell, sir, with us again. Okay. Yeah, welcome back. Yeah, so just one second. Yeah, sorry for that. There was a power failure at this end. Yeah, no problem. And uh, I think we lost a few precious minutes, but uh, <laughs> it's good to be back. And I'm going to the screen share now. And uh, as I go on to my screen share, I will. Uh, just one second. Yeah, the PowerPoint presentation is again opening up.
Yes, sir. We can have. Okay. Uh, we can see so a kind of you. Yeah. Sorry for the disruption. It just happens. Happens to the best of us, I would say. Uh, it's good that it happened in the beginning and not in between. So we can hope that we can go through this presentation from here to the end in an undisturbed manner. So first of all, thanks to the Kolkata chapter and the entire team over there for giving me this opportunity to present this very important topic, which is very close to my heart. And it is modern trends in HVAC related to IoT. So initially we talked about modern trends in IoT, but since we are all HVAC people, I think it's important that uh, we sort of focus on our core area, which is HVAC and sort of uh, go ahead and learn as to what is going on in the IoT field, which is nothing but Internet of Things, when it comes to HVAC. And uh, I remember having presented this topic when it was an emerging technology in Kolkata Recon a couple of years back. And it's very nice that I am continuing with that on that particular thing. And today I will show you what all has already taken place in the last two years. And going ahead, it's one of those things which is really going to excite the youngsters of today. I will play a video also from one of the colleges in India. And you can see how the youngsters are taking on to this particular thing. In fact, in the coming years, uh, this is going to be as important as IT. And IT has done wonderfully well with the Indian youth. It has provided us a lot of jobs and opportunities. And this is another area where you will see quite a boom in time to come. It is a thing, it's a mind thing, and uh, nobody can beat Calcutta or Kolkata in that. So going ahead, uh, let me just go to the next slide. Yeah. Oh. Okay. So what you see in your screen is basically something from the Second World War days. And this was the time when computers or so-called relays were first put to use in order to break the German code. They thought the translators would do it. But then there was a gentleman called Alan Turing who was called in and he set up certain relays and he had these things rotating over there. This was a very fascinating movie at the end of the day. And uh, the question was, I propose to consider the question, can machines think? And he eventually managed to break that code using those particular relays. You did not need a translator. Uh, when a message came, he put it in, he moved those particular relays, and at the end of the day, he got out what message was being sent. So that was one of the first times when sort of electrical engineering was put to use in terms of communication and information. Going ahead in 1960s, we landed on the moon. This, and with the moon, landing on the moon came a lot of technologies that we should be proud of. And one of them was the first handheld remote control. All the remote controls that you use today with your television, with uh, any of the other devices, with your air conditioners, the first handheld remote control was uh, developed by Texas Instruments for the people going to the moon. And you can well imagine that they had a 
computer assistance as far as the controls were concerned. But if you look at it, the ground support computer was all eight megabytes and nothing more. So, uh, you know, from those days, we have grown into electronics, communications, and what, ha what you have uh, to today's age. So let's go ahead and see how basically the computers have developed and how has air conditioning developed side by side. So 1978, the DOS and the personal computers came in. In 1983, the word processing came in. 1984, the spreadsheets came in. 1985, the desktop publishing came in. And in 1990, the digital photographs started coming in. I will just take a second to take a uh, okay from Manish that uh, I'm being heard on the system. <laughs> Don't want another disaster at this stage. So Manish, can you just uh, do a thumbs up that you are getting the audio? Yes, sir, you are clear. Very you good, are... thank you, thank you. Okay, so let's go ahead and see what happened next. 1990, we had the LAN and the RS-485 and 232. Uh, the Windows, in fact, came after that. And around 1991, we started seeing the Windows systems being operated. And uh, the modems came in. So we were basically dialing up sites and getting on to the internet and things like that. And as the modems came in, that was the same year that we established communication with our chillers using the modems. So it's as old as that. Uh, by 2000, the internet was directly there on IP-based systems and we did not have to dial out and things became much quicker. And uh, all of you would probably remember, uh, I'm say those who are about 30 plus that in 2000, we had the Y2K and we were hoping that uh, a lot of things would come to an end, but we tied it over that and carried on with our revolution that uh, microprocessors have to offer. So let's go ahead and see how the advances took place in HVAC systems in a very quick uh, rundown on that. So 1980s saw the major advances in microelectronics, early 80s. We had an electronic temperature indicator. I remember seeing my first electronic temperature indicator in Mumbai in the State Bank of India plant room where the operator could show me inlet and outlet temperatures of each of the chillers by simply pushing a knob to the next chiller. And we would say, wow, what a great thing this was. And uh, the step controllers went electronic. That was the next thing. The step controller used to be kind of a rotating thing, a rotating camshaft that went electronic. Proportional control started coming in and the proportional integral derivative control started showing up. The first time we saw temperature readings and other things on a display on chillers was the two digit display, which started showing up on various machines in about 85, 86. And with that, we could make out whether things were working uh, right or wrong. Those of you who are into centrifugal chillers, it was the extended services panel on the microprocessor control panel of the centrifugal chiller. And over there, we could set and see the temperatures digitally. By mid-80s, the parameters on HVAC machines were being read on these electronic digital displays. By end-80s, we had the personal computers. So those of you who were there in the game in 1980s will definitely remember when you had your uh, date with the first PC on your table and the uh, PCs were there, had come out of the computer centers and now you were running things on your tables. So I had the unique privilege in uh, almost in around that particular time to set up a RS-485 LAN using uh, thermostats in different rooms of uh, an accommodation complex. And connected to it was a damper to each of the thermostats. And the air was being supplied by a central air handling unit 
on top of the roof and each room had its own VAV damper and on the, when the land was connected finally to the serial port. Today, even the serial port has become a USB port. And from that, we could see the room temperature, the duct temperature, we could change the set point, we could uh, see the damper position and what have you. We could force all the dampers open, force all the dampers closed. So you are talking about a time when the windows had even not come out. And things moved further, the digital cameras came in and we could take pictures and we could put them on the screen and we could put our data points on the screens. So here we were now basically really looking at the photograph or a kind of an iconic picture of any of our equipment and we could see what basically was happening with that, whether that equipment was on or off and various temperatures, pressures, and different parameters. So this was the time when there was a major emphasis on energy management because of the energy prices going up. And it happens to be that even today, there is a lot of emphasis on energy management where IoT business, IoT-based systems are playing a major role. And, uh, how we are changing between the two is what we will discuss. Uh, there was a lot of uh, talk about sick building syn syndrome and the fresh air systems became very important. And by 90s, uh, the computers were being widely used to monitor equipment using modems. So what have we got between 2000 to 2010? So replacement of pneumatic controls, major advancement in microprocessor-based controls. And ASHRAE came and set up the BACnet. Remember this one, ASHRAE came and set up the BACnet. This will come useful to you when the questions come to you also. So why the BACnet? The BACnet came in so that we could do a thing called interoperability. That means different manufacturers' equipment would come on the same bus and we could take the data uh, seamlessly from any of this particular equipment. Somewhat we have been successful in doing that, but this story has been more is, has become more successful now with IoT. We will talk about it, how things have changed, and it's probably backnet plus 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 now. So there was emphasis on green buildings, formation of USGBC, direct outside air systems became popular, DOAS, what we call them, and DDC controls and BMS on most of the large buildings started showing up and we had the LAN and the interconnected systems. So that was 2010. And then a major thing happened. Uh, the internet became very popular and this was kind of a game changer. So you, what you had was the internet of people. We were sending mail to each other. We were sending files to each other, uh, using the internet for accessing information. So this was at that point of time, mainly concentrated around information sharing, but when it came to the controls, thanks to certain things happening, again, there was a quantum jump to the next level. When things such as equipment started getting connected to the net. And if you remember some of the first things that you saw being connected to the net, which could sense and communicate, uh, here it was basically a simple thermostat which could connect from the net, take the temperature and outside air conditions, and it could seamlessly through Alexa talk to our machines and could put things on and off. You saw many, many other devices also go and connect directly to the net. And one of them was a Fitbit, a simple thing that you put next to your laptop after coming back from our walk and it could tell you how many steps you had walked or 
it has grown today to many, many different things. And uh, then it came to your television set. In those days, we had a 16 point connector, which we used to connect between the laptop and the television set. And we used to really struggle during presentations, uh, sort of making sure that we did not uh, lose the picture or the certain things did not change. And today, all of us use things like, uh, you know, Chromecast or Apple Talk and things like that, and seamlessly uh, project our information onto the television screens. So many more devices like that have come in now, and uh, the net is talking to these devices on a regular basis, and we are getting advantage of that. So was born the Internet of Things. And what is it? And why should we, the HVAC people, care about it? And that's what this presentation is all about. So this is the final goal. This is where we want to reach. This is where the scientists have said, or the engineering people had said, that the world will come to at one point in time, that all the various devices or systems in a city will be talking to each other and interconnected. Imagine in your house, knowing when your next bus is going to arrive at the bus stop and leaving just in time to catch the bus and the bus driver knowing when your train will leave the station and making sure that you reach the station before that. Uh, we are not talking much about refrigeration today, but you can see that refrigerated truck. And today it is almost impossible in the food chain to understand that the temperature at which your product left the cold room did not reach the shelf at the same temperature, that somewhere it got sort of uh, stalled or the refrigeration system stopped working, that food product would today get rejected automatically thanks to the information passing on uh, while things are mobile, and that is thanks to communication technology of all things. And as you are aware, India is also developing 100 smart cities, and we will talk about it, and we will even see a video as to what the engineering colleges are doing in order to uh, make things happen the Indian way. I'm to say, when it came to the earlier things, we were mainly importing them and using them in our country. There were certain enhancements, but when it comes to Internet of Things, you will find that we are trying to get in into the basics of that very early in the day so that we are a party to the development of Internet of Things. So let's go on to the next screen. Uh, this is what tells you that Already in 2020, we had 50 billion devices connected to the net. So it's about eight devices per person connected to the net in the advanced countries and to some extent in India also, because India has taken up very well to these connected devices. And we draw a lot of information out of these connected devices even today. You will see that uh, uh, IoT or transferring information over the devices, there are a whole lot of our uh, stores or front ends which are already running on this particular kind of a system. And we will also understand during the program today as to what is the difference between a normal BMS kind of a system and these Internet of Things kind of system. They are kind of related. It's not that one could have happened without the other, but it's just enhanced capability thanks to the communications becoming so much stronger over the years that things have transitioned now to wireless and other things. And it is now in the domain of Internet of Things rather than just connected BMS. So, when the thing started progressing, you could see that various devices started getting connected to the net. And that is over here in the left-hand corner over here, objects, machines, appliances, and mainly the building started getting connected. 
and uh, taking benefit and new companies like Cisco, IBM, Samsung, Google, GE sort of started uh, jumping into the building's environment and contributing to it by taking out things that would be connected to our HVAC system. And this is where the Internet of Things uh, really took a leap from where it was before. So let's go ahead and see what are these particular things. So when we talk about technology in HVAC, we were talking about compressors or compression, heat exchangers, refrigerants, controls. We talked about heat recovery, variable speed drives, cold chain and uh, FDA verification, sustainability. And today, if you can see, or I will show you how connectivity has brought in a whole lot of these particular things uh, directly to you, uh, providing you information and ability to maintain them and uh, ability to interact with them in a seamless manner from a distance. And let's go ahead and see some of these. The new motors, magnetic bearings, compressors, pumps, cooling towers, et cetera, which are coming out today, uh, a lot of manufacturers have started embedding the information systems into them. That means you really don't need to put any further uh, devices or gateways or other things in order to interact with them over the internet and get the information on your laptops or on your handheld systems. I'll show you examples of that uh, in a short time. So again, uh, there is a talk about transferring data from these kind of systems directly into enterprise resource planning systems. That means you will transfer information energy information from your switchboard directly into systems which will record the energy data and possibly pay a bill tomorrow. Uh, again, it is no longer the domain of just six or seven players. The way the technology is evolving, a lot of medium sized or even startups are starting to participate in it and towards the end of the program today, I will be bringing a startup, uh, Mr. Venkat from, uh, from Hyderabad to show you how he is basically participating in this whole revolution and is assisting or benefiting the pharma industry in getting to save energy. And energy today is one of uh, the most important topics that we have, uh, most of the International Energy Agency or others are talking about uh, controlling the amount of energy that HVAC uses because HVAC uses about 30% of a building energy and buildings use almost 30 to 40% of the total energy that power plants produce. So HVAC is a major consumer of uh, of energy and it's very important that going ahead we track and uh, we sort of control the energy usage using this new technology. In fact, this is what is going to come to our rescue in time to come if we have to reach things like net zero buildings and what have you that we attend a lot of webinars and seminars on. So, have a look at this. This is already happening. Uh, when it comes to power data using uh, three phase sensors, it directly transmits it to a laptop or it directly transmits it to a handheld phone and it doesn't require anything in between. Now, how does it help us? If you can enlarge the screen over here where we have shown the graph, this is showing the energy data in 2017, 2027. There are two bars, the left-hand side one and the right-hand side one. 
So the left hand side one is called business as usual, B A U. And this kind of escalation in energy use for just for cooling will take place in case we do nothing. But if we manage to use various kinds of technology and keep our energy use in check, then there is a different line which shows up, which is much smaller than the business as usual line. And this is going to help us in controlling our energy consumption in time to come. And that's all thanks to the internet of things that we should be able to achieve that. And that's the reason we need to take this on board and grow on a regular basis. So what has happened till now? what has happened in the last two years. Let's go on a little bit. Uh, we know that previously we had an architecture, which I will show in the next slide, where we used to connect up all our devices using inputs and outputs to a controller. Then we used to wire up all the controllers to a hub. And from there, we used to take it to a laptop or a PC, and we had all the information coming in over there. Today, the architecture itself is changing. Some of the pump manufacturers today are providing their skids along with this thing being built in. And you can see there are no wires where the two arrows are showing from one side to the other side. So temperature, humidity, pressure, motion, lux, that means uh, uh, your lighting data and other things, it is directly going to the IoT gateways using wireless sensors at times or wired sensors at time. And from there, the communication is taking place to a cloud. And from the cloud, it is coming down to the mobile app. Now, there are a lot of questions about the cloud. What happens in the cloud? Who does it belong to? Where is this cloud located? And today, Google and other people have come out with Azure and other people have come out with other names. And this is just like a storage system. That means you could have your server in your premises, the way the government jobs or the, or the airport jobs in India want, or they could be resting on somebody else's server close to you or far away. You will not know about it. But, and they will be replicated in many servers so that if you lose data from one server, you would start getting in automatically from the other server. Uh, something like the situation that happened to me in the beginning of this program will not arise in that particular case. So pump manufacturers have already embedded. Those of you who are already on LinkedIn and things like that, get much more information on these particular things. And that is an IoT architecture. So let's go ahead and see where all IoT has gotten into HVAC equipment already. Uh, the next one is probably a damper actuator, a valve actuator, or butterfly valve actuator. Basically, these people started with actuators and then started making their own valves. And today they have come out and put the intelligence into each one of their devices so that uh, you really don't need a central BMS system in order to interact with their devices. Again, it is all cloud-based. If you remember your ASHRAE 90.1, ASHRAE 90.1 really asks for a system pressure in chill water line to be maintained in such a way that at least one of your valve is going fully open. And easier said than done, it was taken down on uh, our normal IBMS or BMS systems. Sometimes the screens were not formatted. Sometimes the analytics were not put in. But now with this kind of a system, it will be very, very easy for them to make out that uh, if the system pressure in a building is set up properly. If you set up a very high system pressure, then possibly uh, a good number of valves out of them, none of them will go to a full open position and you would be wasting energy. 
So it's now, it's basically technology moving in into devices, directly talking to us, and again, coming in into our HVAC domain. So let's, the last but not least one, which I'll show today, is our chillers and air handling units. And this has been set up in India itself. And the people who have set it up are none other than Tata Consulting Services. And so they were into data and communication. So they set it up for chillers and it's already happening that predictive maintenance of chillers is being done by pulling all the data out of the chillers and storing it over a period of time and then using analytics and uh, being able to say whether you are short of gas, whether you have a scaling problem, whether you have any of those particular things, your discharge pressure is unnecessarily going out, going up and you are, it's all energy related at the end of the day. And uh, it's basically analyzing the data at the end of it, what you collect is more important today than just being able to look at the chiller screens and being able to look at the suction pressure, discharge pressure, oil pressure, and things like that. So it is the analytics which uh, people are able to deploy on cloud-based systems, which makes the whole process more efficient and it makes the process, uh, it pays for it, let's put it that way. You are really being able today to take advantage of the information that you are gathering. And today, if you go down and meet any chief engineer in a hotel or a hospital, uh, he will tell you that I don't just need to see pretty pictures and rotating uh, impellers showing me that the pump is running. Tell me what can you save in terms of my annual or monthly energy if I have to invest in a system like this. And that part of the equation basically comes from your ability to store the, the operating data on some of the subsystems, being able to analyze it seamlessly and being able to make out when it was doing a proper operation and when it was not doing a proper operation. All of us in the HVAC field, we are aware of the fact that more we run the systems on part load, the more energy loss we have. So again, uh, when it comes to space temperature, we have all faced it, even during our RACON festivals and other times, that a lot of overcooling takes place. Now, why does the overcooling take place? Actually, because possibly the, the actuator of the valve is not doing a perfect job. I mean to say, you are not being able to close the actuators. The chill water is flowing through the valve the leaving air temperature is coming down. And at the end of the day, where you are having your energy seminar, the temperature is coming down and you are wasting energy. So with IoT, all these things will be tracked in a much better manner and you will be able, and we are already you know, on the path of uh, being able to control, save, and some of the companies that have emerged in India, they are already able to place numbers in front of your uh, owners and uh, establishments and say that they will be able to save this much energy and able to take projects out of that. So you can see how the IoT architecture or how the controls architecture has moved. On the bottom left is 1940s and 1950s. Uh, if you manage to get hold of it, I've downloaded it from the net. There was very crude wiring and we were still transferring information. Uh, in 2010 to 2020, this was our architecture. We formed a core and we put our DG sets and we put our what have you, everything on the same bus. The idea was that every information should be combined and brought into the same computer. And then we will be able to do interactive control. That means if the fire alarm had a signal, then we'll be able to open the doors automatically in secured areas. Today, 
that myth has been busted by basically the IoT way of communication. And you can see the IoT sensors are talking directly to the, to the cloud server. And from there, the client devices are getting information directly. There are also cases where you have the mesh control of sensors, which I will talk about. So let us go very quickly into the differentiation between the IoT-based systems and the BMS-based systems. So IoT-based systems, which are the trend, which are becoming the trend, are hardware light and software intelligent solutions. That means you really don't have the same amount of hardware that you had in the BMS-based systems where everything had to be wired onto the controller. Uh, you basically pick and choose sensors and place them only where they are required. You can have more if you wish to have more, but you basically go and put them where you require them. And the other good part is if you need to move them, then you'll be able to move them very uh, easily also. And they are software intelligent solutions, which basically means a lot more analytics. OEM and machine agnostic, basically you will see in the video also how the young students are uh, basically pulling data from different solutions, from different manufacturer systems. It's intelligence with which they get into each one of the systems and they are able to pull data out. Gone are the days when you had to write large gateways and you had to put data on the same particular structure uh, in order to record it. So that will come out well into the video. The wireless technology, you know, the wireless technology is not just Wi-Fi and mesh. There is the Google Open Thread, there is the Zigbee, there is the BLE. Now, for us HVAC systems, we don't have to, uh, people, we don't have to really go into the depths of wireless technology. As long as the systems are able to give us the information and we are able to achieve our set points, we are able to get our alarms, we are able to do the energy saving, it's, it's done for us. And analytics powered. So if the previous systems had analytics built in, that means you were collecting all the data and you were being able to develop these particular things by which you were showing your customer when you were losing energy, what was the reason certain things were not operating properly, probably uh, IoT would not have come in so easily or early. Today, IoT has shown its you know, has been a disruptive technology because uh, it has brought in analytics along with it. And uh, the best part is if you have a BMS, then IoT systems can go on top of that. If you have, do not have a BMS, you can still put in some sensors and pull information. If you're planning a new building, you can go the way you feel like. And everyone today likes to have basically a system which has a return on investment. I'm to say in the BMS days, we saw the return of investment was not really justifiable at certain times. And especially when it came back to service contracts, we had so much of hardware lying in the building that the manufacturers or the system offerers had to cover that. And the service contracts were costing us an arm and a leg. And uh, a lot of the buildings did not renew them. And as a result, lost uh, not only their hardware and software and look into the building, but also lost control at times. So chances of that happening with IoT-based systems are definitely getting reduced as on date. So here is uh, the sensors which work on Bluetooth. And the next important uh, innovation is the Bluetooth mesh. That means it's not one sensor talking to the controller, but the Bluetooth sensors forming a mesh and transferring information from one to the other. So even if you lose information from one particular channel, it picks up the other channel and at the end of the day manages to reach the sensor to reach the controller and it's bringing down the amount of wiring that we did at sites uh, every day. 
today, indoor air quality is a big thing after the COVID uh, disaster that we had, we are still suffering from. And indoor air quality sensors today are being networked into IoT systems in a seamless way using wireless sensors. And the IoT is able to pull up the, the data uh, within your city as to what is the outdoor air quality and then decide at what uh, speed or what kind of operation it should do with its fresh air system. And things like fresh air systems, IAQ systems will take a lot of help from IoT in order to make them effective in time to come. So better manage energy, lead from the front when it comes to information-based technologies. Can IoT help HVAC to shed the tag that it is an energy guzzler? You know, I, HVAC has been termed an energy guzzler by most of the people who look into energy today. And it is IoT which is going to help us in shedding that tag. I will be doing another webinar on the 29th of this month. If you look up, uh, sorry, the 26th of this month, if you look up LinkedIn and all you can. Over there, we will only talk about energy strategies. What are the different energy saving strategies in HVAC which can be attained using IoT systems? And that is the trend today to save energy using IoT on top of our BMS systems, along with our BMS systems or independently. So another important advantage and what is a trend setter is how do we control small buildings and the retail shops that you see in your shopping centers. Uh, a lot of brands set up multiple retail outlets and they are not really the whole building. And previously BMS was not really developed for these particular outlets. BMS took charge of large buildings and normally applied where you had a large area to be covered. But today with small controllers and uh, uh, wireless sensors and connectivity, multiple sites of one single retail brand are being connected to a hub and the owners are being able to benchmark their one outlet with the other outlet and really find out where, if they are running it in an energy efficient manner or not. And at the end of the day, if you have a hundred shop fronts, then saving even a little from each one of them and being able to benchmark them uh, counts a lot. And uh, the enterprise infrastructure of these include retail chains, multiplexes, co-working spaces, which you see coming up now, warehouses, et cetera. And they are really able to take uh, advantage of IoT-based systems. Uh, energy-based reports are coming out every day. And the operational energy use in this particular report, which is just out a few days back, they say it varies widely between 75 to 220 kilowatt hours per square meter per year. And a lot of work today, even we face the same thing while developing a standard that it eventually goes back to just uh, simulation or you know, uh, design data and things like that. But moving forward, we need to collect this data very effectively from the large buildings, especially from buildings that uh, we admire and we give prizes to, they should be able to give us back what is their kilowatt hour per square meter per year consumption so that going forward, we can pick up the right specifications, the right materials, and build the right buildings and do the right energy saving. That's another place where IoT will be of great help with uh, the energy monitoring. You know, energy monitoring is an independent thing. If even if you don't do anything else, you can set up the energy monitoring on your chillers, air handling units, condenser water pumps, chill water pumps, cooling towers, collect the data at the end of the day, have an energy meter to tell you 
how much uh, cooling you are producing in terms of ton hours or in terms of other units. And you can find basically the energy efficiency ratio uh, kilowatt per ton that your building is doing and take advantage of that. So in a recent webinar, the, the building owners were asked, what is their biggest pain point that relates to them? And 53% uh, answered that it was the high energy cost. 19% of them said on-field asset man management, especially during COVID times. 19% uh, had lack of visibility across building portfolio. And 8% only had occupant complaints regarding comfort. So you can see uh, when it comes to a building owner or a building operator, it is not just comfort which is troubling them, but the high energy cost and uh, the cost related to the amount of money that we are all spending on air conditioning. And this is even troubling uh, the planners, the policy makers. And it is their saying that digital tools and sensors are key to enabling transformation of urban energy systems to reach net energy goal, net zero goals. And we are all aspiring for it. So if we have to reach those uh, uh, net zero goals and energy numbers, it's only logical that we get on and follow this trend of IoT energy monitoring. Again, this is uh, something on net zero. And what it says is that the building industry must now come together and commit to measuring the whole life carbon emission. And part of measuring is basically your energy measuring, uh, which needs to happen very early. So here are some of the examples that one of the IoT system providers has been able to go and fix their systems into and Domino's Pizza, about a thousand outlets, uh, FNB chains, hotel buildings are coming in more and more into that. The supermarkets are coming into that. The retailers coming into that. And it's now on its way into new jobs and other things and a lot from the energy perspective. And that is the trend. So this is where we want to reach at the end of the day, connected infrastructure in order to keep track of our energy, in order to make life better. You are hearing so much about driverless cars and things like that. I think that will take a lot of time in India to come. But as far as the connection of infrastructure is concerned, you will see things happening very, very quickly from now going forward. And at this juncture, I will play a short YouTube video uh, of a institute called International Institute of Information Technology, which is kind of doing wonders in setting up standards. And uh, give me a second. We had tried this video out before we started the program, but since I had lost my system and rebooted, I will have to go out and uh, come back again. So I think the first thing that I need to do is uh, is stop the sharing, okay? So I have stopped the sharing, just give it a second. And now I will go to the video. All the way to Toulouse, where they got to collaborate and research with Monte at the last CNRS laboratory. 
we were very inspired with one of the buildings where they wired the whole building. It was a building which itself is a data lab. All the sensors were there, air conditioning, solar power generation, power consumption, what's coming from the grid, what is going back to the grid, it's generating data for research. And we were so inspired. Yes, sir, this is audible. Let's make our very whole nice. campus a smart campus. So now that we know how the COE started, let's be in motion and took Ramesh and his team all the way to Toulouse where they got to collaborate and research with Monte at the last CNRS laboratory. We were very inspired with one of the buildings where they wired the whole building. It was a building which itself is a data lab. All the sensors were there, air conditioning, solar power generation, power consumption, what's coming from the grid, what is going back to the grid, generating data for research. And we were so inspired and we said let's come back and let's make our whole campus a smart campus. So now that we know how the COE started, let's meet the people who brought it to life. No one better than Suraj Bunagiri can illustrate the success of this story. My journey with One Antrum started by losing a hackathon. So it was 2018 Bangalore and uh, that's the first time I heard about One M2M. During the hackathon, I saw its real power. So there was a mock setup where 15 to 20 teams were accessing data and they were building their applications. And none of the teams had any common hardware or common protocols. And yet they were able to access this data, build their own applications in a seamless manner. And in the following hackathon, I prepared well and this time I won. I was fortunate to secure an internship here at IIIT Hyderabad. It started with uh, taking classes and then eventually it led to preparing MOOCs, webinars and conducting an entire uh, lab session for an uh, embedded systems workshop class. Of course, many more people are part of this journey. Deepak Gangadharan is a faculty who was involved in the online 1M2M course development and has been crucial to the research and development behind the 1M2M technology at IIIT Edge. Indian government has started this program to develop 100 smart cities. Uh, smart cities being a complex infrastructure uh, involving different kinds of uh, technologies, uh, there is a requirement of interoperability uh, in order to interface the different uh, technologies. One of the widely accepted interoperability standard is 1M2M. We have uh, developed a course at uh, IIIT Hyderabad, an online course, which is going to enable students to gain experience in 1M2M and uh, use it in the innovative IoT solutions that they are going to propose. Professors Sachin Chaudhary, Aftab Hussain and Vishal Garg have been working hard to make the dream of a smart city a reality. The COE has helped us both in our teaching and research. Uh, we have a course called Embedded Systems Workshop and with the help of COE's uh, knowledge that has been gathered here, we revised the course and now all the projects developed by the students have to follow the standards. So students not only develop the hardware, they also put all the... on IoT uh, since its very beginning. new technologies that are coming up in the IoT domain. Being a part of an institution like IIIT definitely helps bringing in very, very talented students into the Okay, so am I back? Yes, sir. Okay, so uh, basically the idea of showing that was that in India itself, we are doing a lot of work on this particular thing. It's not like the previous uh, generations where only BMS systems, I would say we were importing and only using. But at this point of time, uh, basic work is being also done. And there's a lot of uh, talent available in the Eastern part of the country, especially uh, Kolkata, Kharagpur, Jadavpur, and other places. And it will be my request to some of the people who are seeing it today to make sure that this gets out and uh, you know you are able to set up your own sort of uh, you're able to set up your own center of excellence over there and get the students to get into it so that they can benefit from it okay and uh, i will again share my screen uh, i hope a little bit of disruption uh, 
are you able to see my presentation now yes sir perfectly privacy data security data in wrong hands these are some of the concerns i would say whenever yes, we do whenever we do uh, webinars on iot there are a lot of questions about privacy data security hacking data in wrong hands etc now you can see how dr vishal garg and his team those of you who know the isre people know dr vishal garg also he participates so openly in our and so helpfully in our uh, in our isre uh, development and things like that and these things have been uh, sort of bounced off the iot experts that is it going to create problems now the first time that somebody switches your chiller off or air handling unit off or opens your vav damper or accesses your building information without your knowledge you know the guy has to be 10 times better than these youngsters that you saw who were setting up the system so don't be overtly bothered bothered about these particular things focus more on starting it or getting it off the ground in your respective location because it is the future there is no other way out but going on onto these particular things so with this i will hand over to venkat who's assisting me or who's helping me out from uh hyderabad to take you through some of the screens where he will explain how actually it is being put to beneficial use already in the country so i will request admin to open venkat's uh to unmute venkat and i will go on mute here on and when venkat finishes he will pass it back to me or to the admin so over okay. to you venkat and uh, i will stop sharing you can share it from your sure sir thank you mr goel thank you sir um, i have uh, i i hope i am audible yeah yeah great thank you sir so i'll start sharing uh, just to give you a quick preview is uh, and thank you uh, ishray calcutta kolkata uh, for giving me this opportunity and thanks uh, goel sir for uh, getting me on this uh, i'll probably take about 6 to 8 minutes uh, where i will have three parts of the thing one is a video which i'll play for about 2 to 2 and a half minutes that is going to summarize what goel sir said in fact he shared so much information that all of that more or less will get summarized in this video and i'm sure you'll appreciate that after that we'll look at two live uh, setups where iot is being exactly used and how it is being used and as he said you know the three pain points that he talked about mainly is the energy energy is the biggest concern that's what we're going to look at and remote assistance as a to the management is what is required and visibility into their assets so these are the few things that we look at and that should take care of the 8 9 minutes that have been given yeah okay so this is a very interesting video this should summarize a lot of things uh, keep uh, watching this and i think about one and a half minutes into the thing there's an important concept that will actually start the thing we spend 90% of our lives in buildings should they be perfect places to live learn be grow or innovate buildings can be smart like driverless cars planes that fly themselves or our smartphones that control home lighting heating and security systems but will a building continually run analytics to detect equipment failures before they happen or anticipate security needs based on trends and predictive movements of its occupants or create smart spaces where shades adjust when the sun is shining directly in the windows Today, buildings produce thousands upon thousands of data points each day, which literally creates a pool full of data. But in fact, the most important and useful data would fill only. Thank you if you can put the video on. Which cup is most uh, important? Sorry, the video is on actually. No, but share it in that case. Oh, I'm absolutely sorry. I think I forgot that. No, 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 no. That's my my bad. I'm sorry. Don't worry. Don't worry. Go ahead. Yeah, I. think i just quickly yeah sorry yeah so i'll i'll start this again yeah are you able to see that now yes 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 i'm sorry thank you so thank you for perfect places to live learn feel grow or innovate 
Buildings can be smart, like driverless cars, planes that fly themselves, or our smartphones that control home lighting, heating, and security systems. But will a building continually run analytics to detect equipment failures before they happen? Or anticipate security needs based on trends and predictive movements of its occupants? Or create smart spaces where shades adjust when the sun is shining directly in the windows? Today, buildings produce thousands upon thousands of data points each day, which literally creates a pool full of data. But in fact, the most important and useful data would fill only a cup. Just have to know which cup is most important. Tomorrow's buildings will be autonomous. They will always be learning, always be awake 24-7, days, nights, holidays, and weekends. They will continuously adjust based on the current environment and requirements. And autonomous buildings will let your occupants focus on what they are passionate about. Just watch what your building might uncover using deep machine learning and artificial intelligence. Interesting. The power this man is using seems a little high. We may be using electricity we don't need. Confirmed. The power consumption has been increasing steadily recently. Checking the environment. The supply temperature and static pressure are within acceptable range of set point. Fan output is at 76%. All appears to be normal. But the fan output is definitely higher than usual. Checking service records. Ten months ago, the fan belt was tightened. Here is the part number and life expectancy. I see it was last replaced five and a half years ago and have identified the runtime of the air handler. Based on this intelligence, the belt has exceeded the normal runtime and is probably slipping. This is serious. The fan is in one of our most critical building spaces and any downtime will cost us much more than the price of the belt. There is not a belt in our inventory. Ordering replacement. And I have notified our facility engineering department with all the necessary intelligence. As you can see, autonomous buildings learn. And the more they learn, the more autonomous they... I hope uh, that summarizes what uh, Goel Saab said uh, at a very high level. Uh, and that is where artificial intelligence and machine learning is uh, going to or getting to. And I hope you'll appreciate that. So quickly, we will move over to the actual live data that we see. This is a dashboard. Are you able to see my screen, sir, now? Yes. Yeah, OK, good. So I'll just make it a little bigger so that everybody is able to see. Uh, <clears throat> this is a dashboard that we have set up for energy, air conditioning, and other parameters for a pharma company where it is running now. So if you look at this at a very high level, you are able to see the high level data like date, uh, energy consumption, how much is it spent, how much are the DGs supplying and which DGs are on. If you look at these five dots, they are like, are the DGs on or off? That data directly comes to this. Any miscellaneous power like solar, if they are consuming any coal, any oil, all that data can be grabbed from here. And your high-level data, how much is your power loss in terms of value and rupees, your chiller power consumption, and your compressor power consumption. And uh, this, I will come to it a little later. And now, if you look at this, this is because we are dealing mainly on the HVAC side. Now, when you connect to the chiller, uh, you get the data directly from it, like in the beginning when Mr. Goel said, that it is directly addressable. You can connect to a chiller via RS-485 or any such communication mode, and then pull the data from that chiller onto the cloud and push it back onto a dashboard like this. So the question of the uh, 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 management asking, well, what kind of visibility do I get into uh, my assets on the field? So sitting at this location, you are actually able to see how much is my return temperature, how much is my supply temperature, and what are the thresholds, whatever is happening on that. Likewise, he's, this, this customer is able to see all his four uh, chillers working and the four associated compressors and their data. Okay. So this is one way of looking at data, but there can be many ways. But yeah, at least this is what uh, is visible to them so far. 
Now, coming to the energy side, this is also important for them because uh, HVAC or air conditioning co consumes about 60 to 70 percent of the total power inside a building or an organization. Now, if these are 100 devices that are connected on the field and they are represented as small squares that you see in red, yellow and blue. Now, if I click on any of this, ID number 85, that could be one device which is connected remotely on the field and its energy data is what I'm able to see. But more than that, looking at the data, it is going to give you the analytics. The squares that you see in red are the rogue ones, meaning they've crossed the thresholds, hence they are moving to the top. So I need to be only worried about this, click on this and see why, why it went wrong. Or at a summary level, uh, I can look at this by just clicking on it, how many went critical, okay? And this device, let's say ID number two went about six times critical. So I click on this. What are the reasons at what time it went critical? So I can dive uh, into the data and see what is happening. So that's the typical analytics that you can look at from such dashboards, meaning data visualization. And the other important part is I still have controls here. Okay, so two-way communication, that means you can still control the device. So if you see this chiller, condenser, and motor, if I click, these are buttons, remote buttons, where I can actually click on this, and I can control a device on the remote side, on the field, on the other side. So this way you have control, but yeah, as Mr. Goel said in one of his slides, security is a challenge. Yeah, there are people who are addressing it both on the software and the hardware side because there are hardware chips which sit on the controllers which uh, take care of the encryption and all that stuff, okay? So if I just quickly jump onto this side, this is purely the uh, air conditioning uh, page where you'll start seeing certain uh, alerts coming up. And if you want to get into for further details on a specific chiller, these are the ones, tonnage versus electricity. Now you see this red one pointing up, I mean, a card coming up, that is your alert coming up. So delta T versus load, all these things, and your CT fan status, what are the pumps, what are the situations, I mean, what are the status essentially. So all of this data can be configured so that you can see and have visibility into your total system. This is what is happening live from, uh, a customer site onto this dashboard. Likewise, you can look at uh, data in different formats, like your energy. If I just want to look at my DG consumption, I can look at this via visualization. I can switch that off. I can switch this on. I can just do some analysis and a lot of other things can be done. Okay, I think that was a quick peek into what is happening on the uh, energy and uh, air conditioning side. Now, in the pharma industry itself, I'll take you to another quick dashboard where uh, this will show you about a dehumidifier, which is again used. I'm sure most of you are familiar with this being in the HVAC industry. So this is for a client where, you know, he has multiple uh, customers, his customers on the field as in spread across the country. These are uh, the typical pharma companies and each pharma company has different dehumidifiers located at uh, multiple locations across the country. So sitting at one location, they can see what is happening. Suppose this is for Albert located in Goa. Okay, if I click on this, that data loads up for me or I'll just click on this and that data should load up in a moment, okay? And what is that data? This has about nine uh, sensors sitting on the dehumidifier. You have three temperature sensors in red that are the red cards. In the blue cards, you have the humidity and yellow, you have the pressure cards. So as it is happening on the device, you are able to see what is the temperature, is that increasing or decreasing? What is the average in the last few hours and the trend line itself? So that way you can look at all the data that is uh, you know, happening there on the field remotely here and the red ones that you see are the ones which have gone beyond a certain threshold so that is the one you need to be focusing on so if i click on this this is for natco ahmedabad's site is s3 machine number is 61 meaning you are actually be able to go to the machine level and see how that machine is doing and what its parameters are at the same time you have asset data that you can look at last service date was this so you can pop up a lot of information like what we saw in the video you know there is so much more data that you can grab from this and process it to make it happen for the customer at the end of it this is the value what a customer would expect yeah so i think i spent about eight to nine minutes sir i don't want to take too much of your time we can take questions at the end of this 
I probably will pass it on to Dr. Go uh, Mr. Goel, and then he can take it off from there, sir. Sir, over to you, Goel, sir. Sir, you are on mute, sir. So excellent presentation, Venkat. And this is what I wanted to show that it is actually being done. This oh. is the high end of things, you know, where people are very much into energy management. There is another side also where people are into managing assets and costs and retail. So it goes right across, from, across uh, many, many different kind of things. And I will now pass it back uh, to... Nilanjana or the admin to take control okay. and open to questions and let them decide how long they would like to go on with questions. If we have exceeded the, the time, then please send us the questions and we will answer those questions if you can't keep the thing going. But I can see still 41 uh, participants are there and they are well interested in what we are doing. So go ahead. Nilanjana. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir, for that wonderful, wonderful session. I'm sure there are a lot of questions that people want to ask you. I now invite uh, the Zonal Chair what? of East, uh, Mr. Shubham, <coughs> to kindly take over for the question, answer, and the quiz session. Shubham, please yeah. welcome. Yeah. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you so much. So, hi, uh, sir. Uh, well, sir, it was a wonderful session. And also, uh, Venkat, sir, it was, uh, I, we are really thankful to you for uh, showing us those real time data and uh, all those dashboards. Uh, and uh, now uh, this, we have a DL quiz. So basically, uh, for every DL program that we organize, we also at the end of the quiz, we are, at the end of the session, we organize a quiz. And uh, this is a very simple thing. So I will be running a poll on the screen. So uh, all the participants are uh, encouraged to participate and answer those five questions. You will be getting two minutes, uh, and the fastest finger will be awarded uh, at some later stage. They will be informed. And also, uh, we'll let you know that uh, only members will be considered for the uh, for the awards. Uh, although everyone is encouraged to take part, so I'll quickly switch on the poll. Uh, sorry, uh, from the back end, uh, Mr. Shidhat, if you can uh, switch on the poll, can you see the poll there? Hello. Yes, I launched the poll. You launched the poll? Yes, yes. I hope the poll is uh, visible to everyone. If it's not, please let us know. So exactly after two minutes, you can close the poll, Shita. And then display the results. OK. okay. Please let us know once it is done. Are you, are you visible? 
visible well sir i cannot see it sir kindly unmute sir can you see the results i cannot see i am unable to see well sir if you can uh, see the result can i can see the results okay so <clears throat> let us go one at a time basically the backnet answer is correct okay and then after that the maximum people have said 1990 to 2000 now as far as the mesh association it is with bluetooth this is what i wanted people to know that bluetooth has a mesh association now uh indian company which has set up iot cloud based chiller monitoring tcs very right uh i don't know about jci hitachi i'm sure they have set it up but uh, i think my answer would be tcs at this time uh iiit hyderabad coming out with 80% uh on the communication and smart cities and things like that closely followed by iit kanpur i'm sure iit kanpur is also doing something but i'm very happy to see that the message has gone that iiit hyderabad has done a lot of good work in this area but the last one which was vau let me tell you that it is business as usual not building automation unit so when you basically business as usual means that if we do not take any action then our energy graph will keep going up so excellent answers uh four out of five questions by most of the people answered correctly so i would say people were listening <laughs> of course <laughs> of course they would sir you were speaking you can, and they should listen <laughs> yes you can announce the winner whenever you wish to but uh, sir uh, actually we will be announcing at some later stage so we have okay. to evaluate who are members and all those things have to be considered all and right. then we can all right so do you learn, want to launch into questions for some time or is the time uh, getting over yes. yes so actually uh, we have been asking for the questions in the chat box mm -hmm. but uh, till now there are uh, no questions yet so uh, i would once again request anyone if you have any question you can unmute and ask your question so, otherwise or, uh, i i have I, put the email id there okay yes, yes so otherwise i can see that dr vishal garg was there on the program uh yeah. can you unmute him bring him in for some expert comments yes uh Well, sir, if you can uh, kindly unmute and give your views about the session, Doctor Vishal Gar. Doctor Vishal Gar. I asked him to unmute, so let us see. Hmm. Also, for the audience, we have uh, given the email ID in the chat box. So, if you have any question regarding this session, you can uh, give us the question. We will forward it to you, sir. Yes, I think Shubham uh, that uh, if we are not having any questions from our audience, uh, maybe it might come at a later stage. Uh, so we'll. Uh, no, I will just for, uh, excuse me, Manish, if you are there, Mr. Goel, this is yeah, SN yeah. Bose. Yes, Mr. Bose. If you can remember, in the year 2020, you came to Shalbuni. <laughs> yes, yes. For commissioning much. York Link, York Talk, and all this, and yes. still you have your house in Kolkata, or. Yes, uh, no. I'm. I'm still pretty much associated with Kolkata. I try and come. I live in Gurgaon now, but uh, mm. Kolkata is very close to my heart, and a lot of friends and uh, Manojda and everyone yeah, is yeah. over fact, there. Yeah, yeah. In fact, yesterday, yesterday I was talking to Manojda regarding you because after a long time there was no mm. association, mm. and I had been to your house also in Grey Street. Uh, oh, in very nice. Station. I remember. I remember that occasion yes. and all. I was a little. Uh, in a bad shape because i was going to lose my flight and things like that yeah yeah <laughs> so excuse exactly excuse me for that <laughs> and uh, i wish you all the best i'm going to say see we are still there to uh, take this technology forward and you know yeah, in exactly. india it is not just we are going to take the end result from other international places and take it forward but this time we are going to do work on the very basic things also yeah my question and, hmm. is on that only uh, uh, one thing i wanted to basically understand uh, understand regarding the protocol part of it uh, you said about this backnet and all but uh, presently i am also associated with lot of bms and automation work 
in uh, mm-hmm. some metro railways and other big infrastructure projects mm-hmm. presently we are uh, doing some uh, this tcp and ip protocol i mean mm-hmm. uh, is it still I mean, is it significant with these iot or uh, it doesn't work on that no it is significant with iot i am to say even if you have tcp ip you can put in your probes and transfer the data to the iot protocol and the right man to answer this question would be dr vishal garg you know that is why i wanted him to come and probably in a future program we will have him and that's the reason i showed you the video you know in the video those young people were putting in uh, they talked about uh, talking to different kinds of systems and pulling data and doing setting up their applications and my second question is also related to that basically uh, we mostly discussed about hvac industry related to that and vms data which we are collecting and using in a cloud now is it possible to apply the same uh, when we are using a scada system even a system uh, uh, if i try to quantify if it is uh, 100% where possibly the bms is around 40 to 50% and balance is scada then it, is it possible to integrate that also in this iot clouds okay. and all i have not worked on scada system let me tell you but if it is modbus then modbus is accessed by people very much i would like venkat to come in over here if he can and assist me in this particular question but in due course i will talk to the experts and find out where does scada stand you know i had seen a wonderful scada system in in uh, in tata steel in jamshedpur yeah i'm to say that is this... what i was say- yeah exactly <laughs> that's what i was saying right when we will have a bigger industrial infrastructure uh, application in a uh, bigger way uh, there there you have to uh, interface with scada system because mostly this this is a system where uh, it is uh, covering panels boilers and other things right. in one so, go so let me tell you there the yeah. industrial iot iiot is what will come in use and mm. this is a question fit for the center in iit kharagpur or dr vishal garg and other to appraise you on you know we are we are very basic players in this particular thing but what we basically uh, like to do is bring all these uh stalwarts together and sort of have a forum where these questions of yours can be answered so i'm not going to go away from this question i will find your uh, email id contact mm-hmm. you and we shall all form a little forum where these important questions can be answered right yeah, that's yeah. go on sir uh, may yeah. i yeah please uh, go in kitchen to address three questions of bosda yeah so he, his first question was on tcp ip and is it still relevant yes it is because uh, up until today as you rightly said it is uh, modbus over 485 or 432 is what is happening the typical communication and that has been proven since 60s uh, where uh, modicon had gotten the modbus uh, protocol so it is still working and it is still going all the manufacturers and oems are still providing that on top of it with the uh, uh, coming in of internet and tcp ip they are also providing additional communication in terms of tcp ip now with iot the protocol is slightly different meaning it still rides over tcp itself as in tcp ip and the data which is grabbed is called uh, over a protocol called mqtt or its mosquito <laughs> short into mqtt okay now what happens is this is a published subscribe i mean what that does uh, what does that mean is like today we are doing a whatsapp chat or a bot chat now what happens it is like a publish and a subscribe mechanism which works there technically so when you publish some data uh, from a device on the field it it goes over the mqtt protocol directly over the internet on tcp ip to the cloud so data is transferred that way directly and then is sitting on the cloud and it comes back to the dashboards that you have just seen so we use i mean in all of these applications the mqtt protocol i hope i addressed the first question sir and on the cloud you said uh, where is the data going data can be sitting on the on premise servers that is locally on your uh, uh, organization as in your own premises or it can be sitting on the cloud now a lot of people uh, typically in the process industries and the 
pharma industry, they have a concern saying that my data should not go out of my premises. So we do both the setups, meaning setups can be done on the premises itself, where your data is coming onto the local servers. From there, you grab and then do your analytics, data processing. Venkat, okay. I will just stop here for a moment uh, for sure. my understanding that yes. these data transfer, which you're talking about from cloud to server, is it... Mm -hmm. uh, uh, yeah. what is the medium is it some ethernet switch or some some sort of uh, any uh, media which is happening or uh, this uh, basically the data i mean from uh, this cloud uh, mm -hmm. do do we need to transfer the data to server or it is first getting stored to server then it is getting transmitted to cloud i mean what is the arrangement like okay i'll i'll just clarify a quick point here the cloud and server are no different just okay. that the server is sitting locally on your premises okay right. and on the cloud is nothing but another server storing your data now today typically when you have to maintain your servers like for example gmail off late if you have noticed a lot of people have switched from local mails maintaining and managing all the mail system they have moved to the cloud like gmail for example okay. gmail apps so data is sitting on a server in the cloud, which you don't know where your server is. So for example, your Gmail could be sitting in Singapore, mine could be mm. sitting in Hong Kong or uh, yeah. France. Okay, so you don't care as long as oh. your data is okay. coming back to you. Okay. So when I, I got it, right? So I, yeah, I, have, I have got it. I have, yeah, yeah, I have got it. So it's only a matter of pointing where your data should be sitting. Yeah. Okay? Right. Now, coming to your third question of SCADA and its integration with the BMS as well as other systems. Now, you know, SCADA is typically where we see in terms of uh, a process industry or most manufacturing industries. Now, Goel Saab said that is the IIoT, which is industrial IoT. And there's a new concept which is coming up or which is there already called Industry 4.0. Now I'll just talk uh, after addressing your question a little bit on Industry 4.0. Now, with respect to SCADA, they manage all their processes like every, uh, you know, in a process industry, you have a raw material entering and your finished goods uh, getting out of the process line. In between, you process the raw material into multiple uh, or uh, undergoes multiple transformation, like applying temperature, pressure, melting, heating, you know what, all those things. We work with uh, cement and pharma in cement industry you have the co the lime being crushed and then you have the particulate matter you uh, filter it and you do so many operations along the way and their scada for them energy pressure and temperature are the key aspects now scada monitors that at the same time you still can introduce iot into it where we are doing for about 600 energy meters integration with their scada now, what happens is today their system is loaded. They said, okay, can we get, our, I mean, use a different system to monitor the energy uh, inside the plant. So what we did to that effect is connected all of them uh, by a Modbus again, because the uh, meters only talk on Modbus as it stands today. At the end of it, you have a gateway and gateway gets on TCP IP and then transfers the data to a server from there. Uh, you can actually fork it, one directly to the process to the SCADA, second to the server, where you are storing the data for subsequent analysis. And when you are feeding to the SCADA, you integrate with their processes. Uh, there are different protocols that can be used, depending on the OEM protocol that they have. Typically, they use OPC UA to grab data. That's how it happens in the traditional systems, which is slowly, slowly I wouldn't say fading out, but yeah, it'll, at the end of it, when uh, IoT comes and MQTT protocols come, they will slowly fade away because this is the fastest way of transferring data and exchanging data. On top of it, when you have slow speeds, the challenges are handshakes don't happen, data drops happen because data is key to a process plant. And at any point in time, if one degree temperature variation happens, probably in pharma, that batch gets rejected. Yeah. So they have to be on top of it. Hence, TCP IP has come out about to be a very reliable technology today because it does handshakes on both the uh, sites. And if there is a data drop also, it will ensure the next time it delivers the data point. Unless there is a physical disconnection like... For example, Prabhat uh, uh, got dropped off, Goel Saab dropped off because of a power loss. But today, battery backups are happening, meaning your devices will not go into a 
power outage situation despite changes in the atmosphere meaning physical infrastructure also okay so scada integration is happening and uh, all your uh, iot gateways industrial iot gateways do interact with your scada supply data or pull data from uh, scada meaning interface the integration happens and rest of it follows and you are getting a real time data like what you have just seen on my dashboards people yes, are yes. able to use that for uh, decision making and whatever yeah. they need to do with that subsequently yeah so did i address your uh, three questions uh, bosda yeah yeah absolutely now my last question is when you are dealing with these two data i mean uh, this uh, uh, bms data and scada scada data now mm -hmm. do you need a different controller to act upon i mean when i am getting uh, getting in the sense when i am receiving data mm -hmm. from bms and when you are receiving data from scada then okay. uh, the decision or action on those data is it a separate okay. treatment or it's a it's a single uh, intelligent uh, so the controller will decide for both the cases okay good question and a very uh, intelligent question put it that way because yeah uh, why i'm saying intelligent is because there's some amount of intelligence also built on to the uh, devices the gateways now these are called edge gateways meaning these gateways sit on the field close to the devices the field devices now i'll just give you an example of let's say you set a temperature range of 20 degrees to 22 degrees now every time if my temperature reading is between these two data points between say if it is giving me 21.5 20.6 and things like that continuously and i need every second data it doesn't make sense for me to send Uh, every second the same data repeatedly uh, to the server or to the scada it doesn't make sense now what i will say is build intelligence into the gateway saying if it goes below 20 give me an alert and if it goes above 22 give me an alert that's when your scada or your other systems will take that data point and take the appropriate action required for that otherwise i am loading the gateway i am sending unnecessary data storing on the server all this happens okay so these intelligent gateways the uh, edge controllers or the edge gateways take care of this aspect and only pass which is absolutely required for the whole system okay and in case of bms where uh, it is not so critical not necessarily critical put it that yeah. way in case of a hotel yes. or something you know if if the power is i mean if your data uh, is lost for a few a few minutes like 5 minutes uh, mm -hmm. the customers may not come and scream at you so oh, oh yeah you know all that yeah. uh, temperature is dropped so mm -hmm. in such cases as soon as the data comes back it will push to the server and server sends back the appropriate commands for it to act from where it left off okay so these kind of decision making happens and there's a handshake between the bms setup or the iot gateways and then the uh, scada system okay so that kind of intelligence is already built into the system and that is being taken care and it is evolving as we go earlier it was pure data today it is intelligence with ai and ml uh, which is built which you have seen in the video you know yeah, it yeah. is getting data and saying the belt is uh, already 5 months old so you got to replace it there's no part i need to order it and the lead time is say 1 month or something like that mm -hmm. so asset management is also getting built into the whole thing you know that is the intelligence getting into the iot devices oh so thank you yeah yeah i have a question sir thank you sir uh, thank you for answering those questions okay. and uh, i think we're running out of time now so uh, quickly at one second uh, request uh, shubhranath bose sir to kindly deliver the formal vote of thanks and then we can close the session yeah exactly uh, yes so um, honestly uh, after a long time <laughs> i am listening and seeing uh, Mr. Pro Pravat Goel, so that is really a pleasure to me. And uh, on behalf of uh, Kolkata History Chapter, we thank all uh, three, Mr. Goel, Mr. Venkat, and uh, Dr. Gal for joining with us and really enlighten us about this. Because uh, to be very honest, this is the first time even. i have learned this or, or rather i will not say i have learned this i will say i have heard about it so uh, i will request isha kolkata president that uh, in future also we need to 
uh, have another session for follow up or any advancement which is happening because it's a technology uh, it only grows so once again we thank you very much for this uh, enlightening session with us and we hope also we will have a number of sessions uh, regarding this subject with the help of mr goel mr venkat and dr gar thank you thank you thank you and uh, as a concluding note i would say that get your youngsters into it you know don't let them sit out in the fence provide all assistance so that they can get on to the bandwagon because this is the future that's all i would like to say yeah absolutely in my talk you know it is it is very important that the youth in calcutta who's uh, so much into mind things and all gets going like hyderabad has got going and you're absolutely enough, right and because... there is jadavpur there is shipur there is kharagpur there is everyone take dr uh, vishal garg's help if you need to do anything but get a good center of excellence or center of beginning started for the youth in calcutta thank you thank you thank you, thank you sir thank you i will yeah. yes thank you sir okay yeah. so manish uh, with your permission yeah, thank you goel sir uh, it was really an uh, enlightening evening and uh, we were uh, anticipating such an evening from your end and we have got i'm sure that we have more, got more than what we had thought of uh, and uh, i would like to thank each participant and the back end team of kolkata the chapter uh, for helping us move ahead and we definitely as bosda had uh, pointed out uh, will have another session uh, on today's evening in the near future thank you everyone good night take care bye bye thank you sir thank you so much thank you kolkata chapter thanks bye